I'm gonna be round my vegetables. I'm gonna chow down. If only vegetarians use their mouths for shoving nuts and leaves into and nothing else. But they don't. They open them to proselytise and to threaten and to issue doomy warnings. Not, you'll note, to rhapsodise about the joys of a leguminous diet, but to berate those who don't or won't follow such a regime. Vegetarians do not espouse a gastronomic preference, but a cause. These nutheads wear a moralistic mask, a badge of aesthetic superiority. I'd have nothing, well, practically nothing, against these people if they suffered their disease in silence rather than try to infect everyone around them. If only they'd eat rather than preach. Maybe in the next century, maybe not even in my lifetime, people will look on eating meat as killing human babies or things like that. It will be as abhorrent to them in future years as it is to me right now or, or to most people when it comes to killing humans. Who knows? I mean, if there's reincarnation, we might all come back as, uh, as a pig or, a, or possibly... Mind you, there are a lot of pigs around who are human beings coming to think of, but uh, might come back as a dog or a fly or something like that. Maybe by me talking directly straight into the camera and out into people's living rooms, maybe I will influence some of you, even with my mental powers. Maybe after this program, you'll become a vegan. Why should this country be so susceptible to vegetarian conversion? I suppose tolerance of nonconformity doubtless has something to do with it. But really, there's nothing more conformist than mass nonconformity. <coughs> Most British converts are not Jains or Buddhists or Seventh day Adventists, all of whom are at least consistent in their delusions of herbivorous holiness. The fact, however, that carnal proscriptions may be religiously founded does not make them any more acceptable. I don't think you can be a true Christian and not be a vegetarian. It's just not possible because the, the, if you read the teachings of the Master, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't bringing this through this great message of love only to uh, slaughter the animals with a, with a knife hidden behind his back. There are very few vegetarians in France or in Spain or in Italy, but then there wouldn't be. Those Catholic countries possess a vernacular culinary tradition. Food is not a peripheral frivolity in them. But here we lack consensus cooking, so to speak. We thus pray to fads. Vegetarianism is one such fad. There is a big change in this country to watch food, and it will continue, but it's going to take a long, long time before they're on par with the French. They do not care about what they eat. I think Anglo-Saxons in general aren't very interested in food and therefore very happy not to uh, enjoy their food but to feel virtuous for, for what they don't eat rather than take, have a take voluptuous pleasure in what they do eat. There are of course countless delicious dishes that require no meat, no dairy products even. But they're not part of the vegetarian repertoire which is invariably characterised by heaviness, blandness, insipidity, crudeness, clumsiness. It seems deliberately dreary. These people can't even do masochism with brio. And they're lousy hosts too. 
It's a truism that carnivores always accommodate the tastes of their vegetarian guests, but that vegetarians rarely have the courtesy to reciprocate. Uh, you do find yourself in vegetarian company being given vegetarian food, and it's not too bad. You can get away with it. I don't think it's very good for you. you know, I think it um, creates gases in the body, which probably aren't at all healthy and uh, not good for the environment either. But I, but I, I put up with vegetarian food when it's there. Uh, Personally, I won't sit at the same table with people eating meat. Simply because I wouldn't sit at the table with, with someone beating their child or, or, or beating their wife or beating their husband. So why would I, I condone the kind of cruelty that's involved in the meat that arrives at the table? I'm going to keep well my vegetables card off and sell my vegetables I love you most of all my favorite vegetable vegetarian food may have an ancestry in the annals of denial but it has no gastronomic roots so to speak hence the appalling combination which veggies appear to delight in uh, carrot and cashew nut cheesecake or carob and hazelnut, crispy, coconut-coated nut rissoles. The main trouble with vegetarian cooking is that vegetarians, maybe from some nutritional deficiency, have a have very sweet tooth. And the sweet tooth enters into everything that's meant to be savoury. So you might get lentil leek bake with banana and pineapple, or hazelnut crispy, coconut coated, nut rissel. That sort of thing. Delicious. Who wants to leave a good leg of lamb just for a vegan meal? I mean, you know, you have to be insane to do that. The problem with vegetarian food here is we don't really have a tradition of eating vegetables in a special way. So vegetarians sit around thinking, oh, what shall I eat that's vegetarian? And all they can come up with is soy this or top of that. They have to invent these totally ridiculous foods out of nowhere, which tastes revolting. Just as bad, though, is the veggie food that compensates for its meatlessness by forcing, say, bean curd or pulses or nuts to mimic meat, to pretend to be steak or sausages or whatever. When you want people to change over from meat, and I mean, I'm aiming at the truck driver. I'm saying, look, forget that big chunks of flesh in there. I'll give you the same thing and you won't be able to taste the difference. See, we barbecue, and it's fun because we, we get these textured vegetable things and they're just like hot dogs or sausages and burgers and steak and everything. And we've had people come to our barbecues who are vegetarian. Like this is surely an admission of carnal envy. It's akin to the consumption of low-tar cigarettes or non-alcoholic lagers. It's so pitifully careful. My favorite vegetable. In the beginning, there was Pythagoras who set up the first vegetarian community. They ate only honey, nuts, fruit and bread. They anticipated the current craze for colonic irrigation with herbal bowel cleansing. Pythagoras also encouraged his followers to live in caves and to chew hallucinatory plants for the sake of their psychic purity. Other famous veggies. Leonardo da Vinci claimed not to consume meat although it has been suggested that during his dissections of human bodies, he had to fight off the urge to eat them. A more recently born-again turnip chewer was George Bernard Shaw, who, despite being appalled by the monotony of the diet, was parsimoniously delighted by how much money it saved him and how pleasant were his bodily functions. If I were to eat meat, my evacuations would stink and I should give myself up for dead. As an organised movement, that is, as a sort of faith, vegetarianism began in the early 1800s with the Reverend William Cowherd, a fundamentalist Christian who tried to make Manchester follow the Pythagorean diet. The Vegetarian Society was founded in 1847, when a massive 478 people got together to spread the word. The movement achieved its greatest early popularity at the turn of the century, when the society joined forces with groups campaigning against drinking and smoking. In those years, there were vegetarian rambling clubs, vegetarian cycling clubs, and mushrooming vegetarian colonies, direct precursors to the hippie communes of the late 60s and 70s. 
The no meat diet was Dury Gurr for the alternative thinker. People like Mary Ann Gerling, who received the stigmata one Christmas, not everyone's idea of what they always wanted. She had a direct line to God and founded a new forest sect who dance when God bade them to. She was, of course, a vegetarian. What distinguishes today's vegetarians from the bearded buffoons of a century ago is the fact that they are no longer marginalised. During the 1980s, they forced their way into the mainstream. They've learned how to make a noise in inverse proportion to their number. Their quaint peccadillo has become fashionable due to its Americanization and to its appropriation by the great cons called the diet industry, the health industry, the fitness industry, the workout industry, the fresh body industry. Self-righteousness has been joined by vanity, a vanity which ignominiously dissembles itself as compassion for animals. I think it's very interesting that vegetarianism has grown enormously popular ever since the appeal has been less to moral concern and more to narciss narcissism. I think when I was eating meat, I wasn't as healthy as I am now, and I ate too much. In fact, I was a couple of stone fatter than I am now. Certainly when I lived at home and ate lots of the wrong things, I had two or three stone more on me. And uh, I just find that meat stays in the system so long and slows you down. On the dietary side, meat is not very good for you. It's full of cortisone and antibiotics. The animal might have been ill. You're actually not eating very good food anymore. The press uh, thrives on shock horror stories. Either something is going to make you live forever or it's going to kill you. Recent surveys suggest that people actually come vegetarian now mainly because of belief it's actually healthier. And they may not share a lot of these ethical beliefs. There are other vegetarian groups in England, such as the Asian population, um, who are vegetarian but actually have higher than average rates of heart disease and diabetes in the general population. So the general rule is that you know, avoiding meat is going to protect you from heart disease isn't true. I issued a challenge in which I said I would give £10,000 to four or five adults, preferably intensive farmers, who would live in a scaled-up human battery cage for seven days and seven nights. These four men were very confident that they would last a whole week in the cage, um, laughing and joking as they walked into it. But in fact, they lasted only 18 hours. Carnivores and vegetarians alike should condemn factory farming. It's brutal, cruel, squalid, and it's counterproductive. The meat is not worth eating. If people want to oppose intensive farming, becoming a vegetarian is not the best way to do it. What people should be doing if they're concerned about intensive farming is making sure that they only buy meat which is free range from specialised outlets. And that way, consumer, consumer pressure will force farmers to think more carefully about the way they rear their animals. I try always to get meat that's uh, you know, organic and been running around fields, learning a bit of Greek, speaking happily, singing, skipping. I guess I should be grateful when a vegetarian tells me with dour glee that I risk contracting Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease from the ingestion of beef. But it never seems that such warnings are given in the spirit of altruism. Far from it. A harder heart than mine would reply, yes, lettuce head, but you're far more prone to blood disorders than we are. People who take on vegetarian diets in an untutored way do put themselves at risk of vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, which can lead to damage to the nervous system. Rickets, uh, particularly in children, it's a bone disorder caused by vitamin D deficiency. Eat too much, smoke, do too little, and it may not just be your heart you hurt. There exists an unwitting collusion between pulse extremists and the Minister of Health's tax-funded propaganda, which may not be specifically pro-veg, but which is strenuously directed towards the sort of self-denial of which vegetarianism is the brand leader. 
as long as he's preaching long life, we're foolish enough to think, good old government, yes, that sounds a good idea to have long life. Well, then you examine this long life which it's offering, and it's a life in the last 10 years, perhaps, spent in a sort of semi-conscious state, lying in racks, uh, being turned like, like wet hay three times <laughs> every 24 hours. There's a great danger in our society of, of blaming people's ill health on them. Yeah. And this is typified in sort of government policy nowadays, that if you're ill, you're somehow culpable. I think the truth is that 80% of what's going to happen to you is going to happen anyway. That is partly determined by genetics, by factors we don't understand. And then maybe you've got 20% to play with. If I were really told you'd live to 92 instead of 90, or 58 instead of 56, I'll tell the doctor to go to hell. Yeah. For two years, and vegetarianism, no, sir. I'll go down with the meat. One week you hear in the paper that you mustn't eat that, you mustn't drink too much wine, or you must have margarine. The week after you hear margarine is bad for you because it can cause cancer. You know, at the end of the day, you know, go and eat and be happy. Vegetarianism is an instrument for the suppression of hedonism and of the enjoyment of the brief period that's allotted to us. We even have to borrow the very expression, joie de vivre. I don't mean to suggest that hedonism is necessarily conditional upon the ingestion of large amounts of dead flesh, but I would argue that pleasure is a quixotic pursuit in a country which so willingly submits to a culture of repression, which is so mutely deferential. By far the most influential vegetarian of the modern world was Adolf Hitler, who was also a non-smoking, teetotal opponent of blood sports. Many of his qualities are shared by today's extreme vegetarians. Fanaticism, a background in crankish cults, and, most telling, a moral inversion in their attitude to animals. And I feel that there's an exact similarity between what the Nazis did to human beings and what we are doing to intensively farmed creatures today. This vegetarian came across and sat, and he got very hostile to me because he belonged to, I think, the Goose Liberation Front or something like that, and that he would lay down his life for go the, the goose's liver, and that, that I was a reactionary, and, I, and you, Dr. so you're always talking about, about the freedom of blacks, and he, he actually equated the freedom of blacks with the freedom of the goose. No, I can't, I can't understand that. I can't be anything but hostile to that kind of tyranny. I think most of us, honestly, if we thought that someone that w we knew, or someone we didn't know, his life might be sp spared through research on animals, I think very few people would say, no, you know, let the rat live. The odds are that you will get more punishment if you abuse an animal than if you abuse a child. So it speaks for the nation. The nation care far more about their animal than they seem, or they seem to care far more about their animal than their kid care for their children. Hitler declared that the Aryan is closer to animals than he is to Jews. A similar but evidently less deadly sort of zoophiliac relativism is manifest in today's dangerously sentimental turnip people. Every day, in this country alone, we witness the equivalent of the Jewish Holocaust in the Second World War. Whereas it took the Nazi exterminators six years to dispatch the Jews, the homosexuals, the gypsies, the, the subnormal, the politically unacceptable, we dispatch we, no, we not dispatch, we actually brutally murder six million sentient beings every single day of the year. This false equation of humans and animals degrades humans. We are more unlike animals than we are like them. But try telling that to the poor benighted dorks who have the temerity to compare factory farms to Auschwitz. That terrible place was a site of the mass destruction of people. The gulf between humans and animals is so vast that thankfully only about 4% of the population is unable to see it. But that's still something like 2.5 million people.
many, it appears, from the gregarious trades of theatre and pop music. Gregarious derives from the Latin word for flock, and thespians are nothing if not sheep-like in their conformity to daringly controversial faiths and sects. These spudheads are so caringly alternative, they've got a cause ready-made, straight off the peg, different, without being too different. It confirms membership of the great concerned. But the great concerned are not so concerned that they shun leather or chicken or fish. I try to lead my life in the most inoffensive way I can. I don't like to eat eggs because I don't like e eating eggs, but I'm not a vegan. And I have worn and do wear leather shoes. And I don't feel happy with myself for doing that. But maybe in time, I will too be kinder and stop wearing shoes. I don't eat any animal products. Uh, on the other hand, I do wear leather and uh, things like that. So probably I'm not the most wonderful vegetarian in the world, but I, I do my bit. And what will happen to all these lovely little animals that turnip tubes won't touch a hair of? And what about the human cost of unemployed farmers kicking their heels on land unsuitable for crops? If the, the consuming of meat was outlawed, the whole of rural Britain would collapse, the whole of rural Europe would collapse, the whole of rural Africa would collapse, the whole of rural America would collapse. And I don't think very vegetarians ever conceive of it like that. And what would we have in its place? You would have a peanut industry, I suppose. From saving animals to saving face, literally. Vegetarianism, so its adherents wish, is an instrument of rejuvenation. Nut crunchers are ageist utopians striving pathetically for immortality because they fear death. Rejuvenation is an ancient wish, a perpetual ideal. We need only look at our funerary practices to understand how our fear of death is pervasive, how the dead are perfunctorily dispatched, sort of swept under the carpet. We don't keen, we don't wail, we find it all rather embarrassing. The British are a fastidious, squeamish people. There's this ubiquitous tendency to pretend that death is not going to visit us, but it is going to. And no diet, no matter how strictly followed, will summon up immortality. Besides, who would wish to inhabit a world populated by vegetarian immortals? Imagine a 500-year-old Paul McCartney. The problem is, immortality is not an alternative, and I think you'd be quite wrong to think by adopting a vegetarian diet you're going to live forever. Have some more chicken, have some more pie. It doesn't matter if it's boiled or fried. Just eat it, just eat it, just eat it, just eat it. Just eat it. While Europeans are more eclectic in their taste than the British, the Catholic cultures are particularly so. They not only have the ability to cope better with death than us prods and to appreciate the function of ritual, they also enjoy a wider acquaintance with the innards and extremities of animals. It is a repulsion. When you talk to an English person, an average, and you said, what about the nice brains with capers? You feel they're going to vomit. They would not eat it. They would rather die. I always feel that uh, they won't even try it. And uh, it isn't part of the Catholic mentality to deny yourself you don't have to. Whereas the Puritan attitude starts from the premise that pleasure is itself suspect and, uh, uh, and to be avoided if possible. And therefore anything which gives pleasure, and anything especially which gives pleasure at the expense of any other living creature, is probably wrong. The word vegetarian is American slang for people who have no taste for fellatio or cunnilingus. Harmless pleasures, 9 out of 10 cardinals recommend them. Vegetarian is also, in chess patois, a passive, non-penetrative game plan. It all makes perfect sense. Cucumber abusers may be dietetically non-conformist, but in their self-censorship, goody-goody cockiness, peptic correctness, sanctimoniousness, in their hatred of anyone having a good time and their conviction that they're more wholesome than thou, they're so orthodox that they truly constitute a fifth-column cult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>
Next week, Autoerotic returns with a look at the rather more sedate, but still seductive, family car. And in Dead West, photographer Richard Mizrach shows us the hidden horrors of the Nevada desert, where the American military has spent four decades rehearsing the apocalypse. That's the autoerotic allure of the family car and how the West was bombed. Next Tuesday at 9 on Without Walls.